Welcome to Aleph, Traditional Wisdom in Review. Aleph is a digital media collective dedicated to publishing philosophically engaged content which brings together perspectives from both classical Islamic sources and the Western intellectual tradition. Our hope is to go beyond a model of mere dialogue and develop an approach focused on synthesis, the discovery of new relations, and the creation of points of integration. This podcast is part of a series where we interview the authors of the articles we publish to take a deeper dive into some of the information and topics they explored in their writing. Today I am joined with author Esme L.K. Partridge to discuss her article, How to Cope with Self-Isolation According to a Ninth Century Islamic Philosopher, where she explores the thought of Al-Kindi and his relevance for our current situation. Esme is a student of religion at the School of Oriental and African Studies in London. You can find out more about her and connect at esmelkpartridge.com. Now, on to our conversation. Hope you enjoy. All right. uh, Thank you for tuning in. I'm here with one of our wonderful authors, Esme, who's going to be talking a little bit about her article about Al-Kindi and self-isolation that that we published a number of months back now. So uh, if you haven't read it yet, this is uh, uh, you're going to get a little overview here, but there's, there's a lot uh, in that article. So please head over to our Medium page and, and check that out if you, if you are interested in, in any of our discussion here. So hi, Esme. Hi. Good to have you on. I'm excited to, to chat about your article and Al-Kindi and all these interesting topics. So, Absolutely. Let's go for it. Wonderful. All right. I think a, a good first place to start is just to to give our listeners a little background on Al-Kindi and uh, what his uh, importance and relevance is uh, for any of those uh, listeners who haven't encountered his work before. So Al-Kindi is often described as being the father of Islamic philosophy, and he was very much the pioneer of the scholastic movement, which was taking place in the ninth century House of Wisdom in Baghdad, which was coalescing Greek philosophy with Quranic theology. And what this produced was an incredibly rich synthesis of spirituality with the natural sciences of the time. And this is very striking and genuinely quite refreshing to see coming from a Western background, where we're so accustomed to this notion that there's an an inherent dissonance between science and religion. We're often exposed to these dichotomies between science and religion, religion and rationality. And I've always, at least personally, always felt very intuitively that this is a false dichotomy and that it's just simply not not a concrete reality and if anything the two actually complement each other it's a very very much a post enlightenment construct which is trying to exclude the metaphysical from the physical and surely appreciating and understanding the world around us is is a crucial part of faith you know it's an aspect of perceiving God and his attributes and trying to decipher them, which, which I would argue is, is deeply mystical in itself, right? Because you're reconciling with the intelligence of God. So Al-Kindi very much offers an antidote to this. And indeed, many of the Islamic philosophers that follow him do also, because they get this harmony between religion and science absolutely perfect, in my opinion. You know, for example, many of Al-Kindi's works will will begin with a praise of Allah, which will then flow seamlessly into an eloquent extrapolation of physics or mathematics. And I just think this is a really refreshing perspective in this very divided world where science is completely profane, people aren't really trying to understand religion, it's sort of this other. And We really need this approach that blends the two. Um, And on that note, I really would recommend reading Sayyid Hussein Nasser's book on the need for a sacred science. Um, That's a a contemporary approach to this issue, which does draw on traditional Islamic philosophy. Um, But this is a much more practical handbook. How can we resolve this problem? And I think, as I say, Islamic philosophy is very much the, the way forward for this issue. Wonderful. Yeah, sounds like uh, such a, a profound and, and helpful writer in, in even our, our times today. So yeah, next I, I'm, I'm interested to know how you were able to sort of utilize his, his thinking, his philosophy, to bring that to bear on, on these current events with, uh, with the pandemic and, uh, and this uh, idea of isolation for the greater good. 
Yeah, so the article draws on his treatise on dispelling sorrows, which is one of his over, I think it's about 270 works he wrote, I believe, on the most obscure things. He had treatises on beekeeping, sundial making, perfume making. He was a, a true polymath, you know. And his treatise on dispelling sorrows is quite unique because it offers much more practical guidance. Much of his work is concerned with deeply philosophical and mathematical topics, and it takes a very, very scientific science heavy spin on things um whereas this is is slightly more prescriptive it, it tells us what can we do to be happy ultimately and particularly in a time where we're really having to question should we really be placing our happiness in the so-called world society that we're so accustomed to it's made a lot of us question we can't really rely on this all of these things were very much an illusion of stability and that's why in this article I've chosen to draw on this treatise on dispelling sorrows. So the essential premise of the treatise, which Al-Kindi is, is writing here, is that we need to distinguish between there being two levels of reality. Now, the former level of reality is what I was just referring to. It's this idea of, of the physical world which is around us. And in Islam, that's known as the dunya. And this is a world of transience, of unreliability and contingency, and it's constantly undergoing what Aristotle called generation and corruption, which is a set of terms which Al-Kindi himself often emulates because he's drawing on Greek sources a lot of the time. Now, the latter realm, the latter level of reality, is the one of absolute truth and, and ultimately God, and it's a level of eternity. It's static. It's not constantly changing. It's still. It's oneness. Um, and this is a very important aspect of Al-Kindi and indeed many, many Islamic theologians. Theology is absolutely fundamental. It's that God is absolutely one. Now, Al-Kindi does a lot of extrapolation on this. And one of the points which he makes in his treatise on first philosophy is that God is eternal because if God is absolutely one, Tawheed, Anything that changes, anything that comes and goes, exhibits a form of multiplicity because it exists in multiple states, being, not being, being in a certain way, being in another way. So it's not eternal, it's multiple. Now, God, if God is absolutely one, then God can't be changing. God can't be coming and going because, as I say, those are expressions of multiplicity. So for Al-Kindi, he maintains this absolutely essential principle of God's oneness. Now, he applies this to the human experience in that as human beings with intellects, which is a crucial element of this text, the intellect, which I will come back to shortly, we can access this state of oneness. And it's not so much accessing something from outside, it's actually returning to what's within. So in Islam, there's the doctrine of the fitra, which I wrote an article on this previously. And it's this innate innate divinity within the human soul. And through this, we can access a degree of the eternal. Now, the means through which we do this is through the faculty of the intellect, which is highly noetic in Al-Kindi's philosophy. Because for Al-Kindi, the intellect is closer to God and it can access higher truths. And most importantly, it can access realities which do not perish. They don't come and go as the material world does. And so in that sense, there are perfect perfect refuge, for want of a better term maybe, from the transience of the material world. If you place your happiness in things which are coming and going, generating and corrupting, you'll inevitably be disappointed. If you really want something which is reliable, you must turn to this second level of reality, away from the dunya and towards the eternity of God, the ultimate truth, al-haq. And that's essentially what this text is an instruction manual for doing. And actually, I'd like to add, because since I, since I wrote this article, I've been reading a lot of Al-Ghazali, who, who is of, of a very similar, well, actually that's controversial. Al-Ghazali is quite a, a controversial figure for many different reasons and his attitude towards Greek philosophy being one of them. However, without realizing it or not, he's, he writes something in his treatise on patience and thankfulness, um, which I'd really like to read because it, it actually really does chime with, with Al-Kindi. So he says, the nobility of intellectual pleasure derives from it being permanent. It does not perish, not in this world and not in the hereafter, and you can never weary of it. One can have enough of food and grow tired of it, 
and when the sexual act is over, one can be wearied by it. But it cannot be imagined that knowledge and wisdom can satiate or be wearisome. When he who is capable of attaining to what is noble and everlasting finds pleasure in the transitory and contemptible, then he is afflicted in his intelligence and will consequently be denied what is noble due to his fallen nature and his rejection. Wealth can be stolen and public office taken away, but the hands of the thief cannot reach to snatch away knowledge, nor can it be exiled at the hands of the rulers, for its possessor is always in a spirit of tranquility, while the owner of wealth and prominence is always grippled by apprehension. So I think that really sums up quite well, actually, what Al-Kindi is talking about in this treatise. And it's that if we truly want to be happy, we have to seek pleasure in the metical, metaphysical oneness of the intellect rather than the transient pleasures and indulgences of the world. Wonderful. Yeah, this is it's all such a such a fascinating topic that that these various Islamic philosophers are are able to converge on here, uh, especially with that uh, wonderful quote from from Ghazali that lines up so nicely. So mm. one of the things I appreciated so much from your article was was all the different uh, connections you were able to make within it. And you, you've been mentioning uh, Greek thought and, and Aristotle uh, throughout this discussion. So could you talk a little bit more about how a philosopher like Al-Kindi lines up with, with these, these Greek philosophers and, and uh, works on this lineage, but also has some uniquely Islamic perspectives on things? So absolutely, there's so many different links to the Greek tradition and also the Buddhist tradition, actually, which is something which I personally have drawn a link between. Perhaps it is slightly tenuous, but nonetheless, I definitely like to articulate on that. So in terms of the Greek connection, well, Al-Kindi was working in a time which shortly followed after the Greek translation movement, which is where Greek philosophical material was being translated into Arabic via Syriac. And so it was very, very exciting, actually, for all of these Islamic philosophers who were very keen to understand the natural world. They were reading these texts. And this really does shine through in all of Al-Kindi's work, but particularly this one. And what is very detectable here. And I've read other people on various forums about this treatise, it seems to really flag up for a lot of people, is that it's very stoic um, in terms of his proposition that we detach from the material world. Now, Al-Kindi himself comes across as being quite a stoic person. You know, he's very studious, self-disciplined. Uh, I mean, I suppose you have to be to author over 270 works, right? Um, but this is, this is reflected in the almost monastic implications of the text and this encouragement of, of moving away from the physical and into the eternal via the intellect. Um, although I, I should say on this note, because Stoicism has connotations of absolute asceticism. And I wouldn't say that that's what Al-Kindi is exactly prescribing. I think there's an important distinction to make here that he's not saying we completely do away with the material and the physical, but it's rather that we shouldn't depend on it or that we shouldn't place our happiness in it. And it's subtle, but there's certainly a distinction there. And um, I've seen this distinction in a lot of Islamic literature, which I apologize for how broad of a term that is because there's so many variances within Islamic literature, but particularly Sufism. Um, there's a Many people are familiar with the Sufi poem, The Conference of the Birds by Atta. And there's a quote in that poem, which is about the nightingale who is attached to a rose and he's failing to move up, move forward in life because he's, he, he loves this rose, he's, he cherishes this rose. And there's a line in The Conference of the Birds which says, give up your fancy for the rose. And I find this quote summative of a lot of attitudes towards the material world, particularly within the Islamic mystical tradition. If you notice carefully in this line, it's not saying that the nightingale should give up the rose. It's saying he should give up his fancy for the rose. If you see the distinction, and I feel that, of course, not consciously, because the poem was composed much later, but I feel that this is an idea which Al-Kindi is tapping into. So I wouldn't say he's completely stoic in that regard, but there are certainly elements of what you could call stoic philosophy lingering here, absolutely. And on that note, it's also worth mentioning that 
there are a lot of Buddhist undertones in here, particularly in terms of his attitude towards the physical world as a contrast to the absolute. And although we could, we could go on for a very, very long time comparing Islam and Buddhism, but you should read Reza Shah Kazimi's book on it, um, On Common Ground Between Islam and Buddhism. That's absolutely the authoritative source on that. But anyhow, for now, um, I should say that Al-Kindi's idea of the material world being transient and ultimately unreliable and thus a cause of sadness, it really reminded me of the Buddhist concept of anicca, which is the second mark of existence, I believe, out of the three marks of existence given in the Dhammapada, which essentially denotes the reality that everything physical is in a constant state of flux. And if everything is in a constant state of flux and we attach ourselves to it, then we end up falling prey to the second mark of existence, which is dukkha. Sorry, I have to correct myself. Anika is the first mark of existence. Dukkha is the second one. And they are corollaries of each other. One leads to the other. Uh, and this is very similar to what Al-Kindi is saying. He's saying, if we attach ourselves to the material transient world, the dunya, which is characterized by this state of anika, then we will naturally become unhappy and disappointed. And Al-Ghazali is saying, you know, we'll always, we'll always be in a state of wanting more. We'll never quite get what we want because at the end of the day, you just will never be satisfied by what the material world has to offer. And so I just found that really interesting. And I'm not sure, but there is an argument actually in terms of historical continuity that actually Buddhism influenced Greek philosophy and Stoicism, and then that came back around. Um, not sure how reliable that theory is, um, but it's none, nonetheless a very interesting one. But as I say, I don't want to get too sort of stuck in the, the chronology of this because I that's absolutely not my expertise. But yeah, it was just, just an observation, really. Yeah, I mean, there's so many, so many ripe connections in, in this material, if you are able to, to go looking for them. And uh, I mean, both these, these more historical connections with Buddhism and, and Stoicism, and then uh, this very prominent connection, uh, just to, to current, uh, current happenings and current context that uh, was sort of the impetus for, for your article here. So yeah, thank you for this this wonderful discussion. I, I certainly learned a lot, and uh, there was a, a a lot of material that I'm I'm excited to to be publishing out for people. So, is there any any thought you want to to leave off uh, for at this point? I think it's really important that we we appreciate this text not only philosophically but also practically, and. I think especially coming from the West, we do tend to, we have this sort of attitude towards philosophical content where you read, you read a text and you sort of annotate it hundreds of times earlier, over and you, you know, oh, that was really interesting. And then you put, put the book down and then you sort of separate it from your life. And I think this is very common in philosophy classes. It's actually one of the reasons why I dropped philosophy from my university course, uh, because I found it had no application to practical, practical life. So I think it's really important when reading this article, uh, and even I have to remind myself to do this actually, you know, appreciate it philosophically, but actually ask yourself, how can I apply this to my life? And I think I've found certainly, and I hope other people have found that if you do turn to the intellectual pleasures, particularly where you have no other option because, you know, your favorite coffee shop is closed and so and so, it really does benefit you. You really do feel that you're you are tapping into something more eternal. The more you the more you allow yourself to explore the intellect, concepts such as beauty and the imagination, the more of a fulfilled person I think you feel. So I would really encourage it and, and do read Al Kindi because his work is so refreshing in so many respects. And I am I, I yeah, I absolutely love Al Kindi's work and I think it's so relevant, COVID or not, it's just always pertinent. So. <laughs> All right. Wonderful, Esme. Thank you so much. This has been been great uh, sitting down and, and discussing with you. So it's been yeah. a pleasure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Likewise, likewise. Uh, for anyone who is interested in following up and, and reading Esme's article, if you uh, haven't yet, uh, you can find it on our Medium page and you can get there from any of our social medias, Instagram, Facebook. Uh, yeah, just uh, search for, for Aleph Review or Aleph Traditional Wisdom in Review and you'll be able to, to find us. So yeah, thanks for listening and uh, have a good day, everyone.